have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 37. I've got good news for you this morning. We do not have 43 verses worth of, of obscure Hebrew names to deal with. So, that's good news. Genesis chapter 37. We'll begin reading in verse 1 and we'll read through verse 11. Let's give attention to the reading of God's holy, inspired, authoritative, and inerrant, and infallible word. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojourning, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zobah, his, brother, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheep arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheep. His brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow down ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the same in mind. The grass withers, and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Father, now as we come particularly to give our attention to your word, we ask, Father, that you would bless us by your spirit, that we might receive what you have offered up for us in your word. It would be built up in our holy religion. It would be built up in our faith. It would be built up in our obedience and our walk before you. Father, would you remove any and all distractions from the reading and the preaching, the hearing and the understanding of your word? Would you remove distractions from me, from my mind, and from my heart? Would you remove distractions from these people, your hearers? Father, would you help even the one that comes weary into this building this morning to be comforted by these words that you have? Father, would you take the one who comes into the sanctuary prideful this morning and convict them of sin by your word? Would you take the one who feels inadequate this morning, gathering together to worship you and hearing your word, and would you build them up and strengthen them by your word? Father, would you allow by your spirit your word to have its intended effect? The sinners would be called to repentance, that the faith will be built up and encouraged, and that you would be glorified. In Jesus Christ, we ask all these things. Amen. It's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. Is that on? Is it on now, Derek? All right. It's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. You've heard it said. You may have said it yourself at different points. It is not uncommon in our lives to come across tasks and responsibilities that we know we have to do. Maybe these are tasks that are familial, like how to care for a spouse or how to care for children, how to care for maybe even your own mother or your own father, how to love accordingly, how to lead accordingly, how to submit Accordingly, you come across these kinds of things at your job, whether you are the employer or the employee. You come across these things out in general in society. Maybe you're the person that likes to put the shopping cart randomly left in the middle of the parking lot back into the shopping cart caddy or whatever they call those things. That's me. I can't stand when those things get left in the middle of the parking lot. they got to be put back. Maybe you're the good citizen that's willing to stop and pick up trash along the side of the road. Maybe you're the person that's willing to give somebody that's walking down the street a ride to wherever it is that they're headed, despite any particular harm that may very well come to you from doing such a thing. 
And the examples could go on and on and on and on. And they could get more minuscule or they could become so severe. And the, 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 the phrase would ring true no matter what. It's a hard job, but somebody has got to do it. The interesting thing as we come to Genesis chapter 37 about what we just read and about what we're about to look at together is based on what we've seen so far, you, you would almost expect this to kind of be the happy ending and for things to begin to ramp, wrap up. I mean, if you've been around the church and studied the Old Testament for any particular length of time, you've heard of the patriarchs. There's three of them, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the three. We've heard plenty about Abraham. We heard as much as there is to hear about Isaac. And we've been walking with Jacob for some, a few weeks now, and it appears as if his story has pretty much come to an end, so much so that even last week our focus and our attention wasn't so much on Jacob as it was on Esau and on his lineage. And so when we come to Genesis chapter 37, verse 1, you, you would almost expect this to begin to wrap up. But actually, we've still got 14 chapters to go before we get to the end. And Moses begins here, Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. And so you're thinking, okay, more names, more lineage, more generations. What does he say? Joseph being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. What we have here is is a shift in the narrative, moving the attention and the focus away from Jacob and even away from the overall 12 tribes of Israel and particularly into the life of Joseph. So throughout the rest of this book, we'll have a few interruptions to Joseph's life, but for the most part, that's who it is that we'll be looking at. And the reason that I begin with this idea of it's a hard job but somebody has to do it is because what we find out in the very opening scene of Joseph's life in Genesis 37 is that he's been given a pretty difficult task. Think about it for just a minute. Joseph is the youngest of 11 brothers, and we know of at least one sister, and presumably there are others as well as we continue to read on in the text. And we know that at some point, whether it was after this or just before this, he also has a baby brother, Benjamin. And so Joseph's in kind of a hard spot. He's not quite the baby, but he's far from being the oldest. Also keeping in mind the particular household that it is that he's been raised in. Remember, Jacob had four wives, and these 12 sons spread out across those four. And remember all the sojournings of Jacob that he's had prior to sojourning in the land of Egypt and all the various things that he's come up against. This is the household that Joseph has been raised in. You ever said of a kid that you saw raised in kind of an unpredict- or a unfortunate circumstance like he didn't stand a chance in the world? It would appear, at least from worldly standards, when we look at Joseph from the very beginning, he didn't indeed stand a chance in the world. And when he's just 17 years old, which many of us should know is a pretty confusing time for a teenage boy, it's a confusing age, he's pasturing the flock of his, with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. Let's paint the scene just a little bit more vividly. Joseph is the son of Rachel, the wife whom Jacob loved. And he is a boy with the sons of Leah, the wife whom Jacob rejected, and Bilhah and Zilpah, the maidservants of Rachel and Leah. You could imagine the way that those boys were thought of in relation to Joseph, given how, much jo- or given how much Jacob loved Rachel. Equally, he probably loved Joseph the same. In fact, the text is going to explicitly tell us that in just a minute. And so Joseph is here pasturing the flock with his brothers, the, the, the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. And the end of verse 2 says, And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now, in this particular phrase, we have some linguistic difficulties. This could mean a few different things. Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. It could mean that he's purely a snitch. Joseph's a tattletale. That's one option. Uh, It could also mean that he came and he he lied about them. The particular Hebrew word used here for the bad report is used in other ways to indicate a, a falsehood, a false telling of a particular event. But it could also be that Joseph was serving as a messenger for his father. This is the particular translation and interpretation that I prefer. 
And the reason that I prefer that is as we move along through the story and as we move through along throughout the rest of Genesis, like I told the kids, we're never going to come to a point in Joseph's story where like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he's not going to complain about the things he's going to come up against. He's not going to make excuses for the things that he does. And we're also not going to see him be rebuked, at least in a righteous way, for anything that he does by anybody of any particular significance. No, clearly Joseph stands uniquely in the narrative as opposed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's something unique we're supposed to see and take away from the story of Joseph. Unlike the others, we actually do have an opportunity in the person of Joseph to see one whom we might emulate. But also, just like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who have we seen, as we see one that we might emulate, we will see one that we will find ourselves completely inadequate to emulate. And so we'll still be left begging that question of what is the hope and what is the answer to all of this. So Joseph brings this bad report of his brothers to their father. And as we read along in the story, it's not going to be hard to derive probably why it was that he had a bad report to give. They're not exactly the best kids in the world. I mean, at this point, we've already dealt with Simeon and Levi who go in and destroy the Shechemites after having them be circumcised so that they might be weak, so then they could go in and kill them whenever they're trying to recover. We've already faced Reuben who has slept with Bilhah, his father's concubine. And so already at least three of these sons aren't really off on the right foot. And then when you put everything else together of the particular household they're raised in, it's really not surprising that they would be what we might call troubled children. And so for Joseph to bring a bad report of his brothers to his father actually isn't surprising at all, is it? No, Joseph is serving faithfully in his father's house. Joseph is doing exactly what it is that his father has sent him to do. And then in verse 3, we come to this grim reality. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age And he made him a robe of many colors. You see, we've had this tension throughout the narrative of the position of the younger brother. You see, on one hand, time and time and time again, God makes promises to the younger brother in contrast to the law of the land that is the older brother that should be the one to inherit the promises and the blessing and the birthright and all those things. But God keeps saying, no, 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 no. The older will serve the younger. The blessing is coming to the younger. So that's one part of the tension. But the other side is this, is that throughout the narrative time and time and time again, it is by earthly and fleshly means that the younger brother seeks to grasp hold of these promises that are made rather than in pure trust, faith, and reliance upon God and the promises that he has for them in his word. And so verse 3 brings us once again into this tension. The youngest of all of his brothers, at least other than Benjamin, yet he is the one that his father loves most. And would we really expect anything different out of Jacob? after all that we've heard about Jacob and all that we've seen that Jacob has experienced, some in relation to fault of his own and and other because of things that have been done to him and against him. Of course, Jacob loves Joseph. But even more than those comparisons, Jacob loves Joseph, the text tells us, because he is the son of his old age. He's a miracle child. In fact, in many ways here, Joseph mirrors Isaac, Jacob's dad in relation to that Isaac was the son of Abraham's old age. Joseph falls right in line here with the rest of the patriarchs who have gone before him. And then verse 4 tells us the problem that this causes. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now we can understand this on an earthly level fairly easily. Here he is pretty boy, the baby, the one that's loved, born with everything handed to him on a silver platter with a silver spoon in his mouth. And of course, it makes sense that the older brothers would be jealous of him and not like him given these realities, wouldn't it? But there's so much more going on here than just a familial tension. You see, is this not the very case that we kind of made last week when we looked at Esau of the realities of the way that the world looks at the faithful? Is this not what we see rise up time and time again throughout the rest of the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms and in the Proverbs? That it is the righteous who are oppressed. That it is the righteous who are persecuted. 
that it is the faithful who face worldly condemnation and despair, that they're the ones who are constantly brought under worldly judgment, that they're the ones who are constantly imprisoned. Those are the ones that, that war is constantly brought up against. You see, it appears to be the way of the world to rebel against the faithfulness of the faithful. Now, in case we have any difficulty grasping that reality, just look at our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The most faithful of all of us. In fact, the one who was faithful on our behalf, because faithlessness is really our only habit, isn't it? But no, Christ came as one faithful in His Father's house to all that God had asked of Him to do. Namely, to live a perfect and righteous and holy life and to die a sinner's death on behalf of God's people. You see, Jesus was faithful, but Jesus was faithful unto death. And so the lesson for us, at least in these first four verses, is just that, that we should expect absolutely nothing else out of this world. It should not surprise us when suffering comes. It should not surprise us when people mock us or deride us. It should not surprise us when people just don't get it. It should not surprise us when people are unable to grasp these truths and these realities that we cling so closely to. It shouldn't surprise us. For it is the way of a fallen world to rebel against the faithfulness of the faithful. It is the way of a fallen world to rebel against the living in the holiness of a holy God in the midst of an unholy people. This is the way of the world. This is the way of the Christian life. This is the way of the saints' sojournings. To walk in faithfulness in the midst of a faithless generation, knowing that persecution will come, knowing that suffering will come, knowing that hatred and jealousy will come, knowing that it will get so severe to where they cannot even speak peacefully to us. Can you imagine the awkward family dinners in that household? Now, to make matters worse, here Joseph is. He's already the errand boy for his father. He's already the favorite of his father for obvious worldly reasons. And now verse 5 tells us this, that Joseph had a dream. And when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. When we face the pressures of a fallen world and we ask a question that maybe we would do better not to ask because the answer just isn't good, can it get any worse? Maybe. Probably. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Notice that Joseph offers up absolutely no interpretation for this dream. It's a pretty simple one to interpret, even if you're not in the particular practice of dream interpreting, which we're not, by the way. And his brothers respond to the simple interpretation of, of this dream. Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Just in case the persecution wasn't enough. Just in case the rebelliousness of the faithless against the faithful wasn't enough. Can it possibly get any worse? Yes, it can. Yes, it can. And in case we are inclined or tempted to ask that question again, can it possibly get any worse? Look at verse 9. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you. What Joseph is telling his family on the surface appears to be absolutely absurd. It appears to be completely asinine. And Jacob finally responds to Joseph whenever he tells him the dream and and, and rebukes him rather than hating him. And then verse 11 says, his brothers were jealous of him. But his father kept the saying 
in mind. You see, on one hand, verses 1 through 4 teach us of the benefit of faithfulness. And ultimately, they, they point us, as we've said, to the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and His righteous, obedient life on this earth. But then verses 5 through 11 teach us something else that is interestingly applicable to our daily living as believers. And that is the progression of revelation in the life of God's people. Bear with me here. You see, so far up in in Genesis, God has appeared to His people and given them revelation. It, It would appear by direct verbal communication. The angel of the Lord appears and says, X, Y, Z. God appears to such and such in a dream. And in the dream, God explicitly says, here you go. But but now we come to the story of Joseph, and Joseph has dreams that, as we've already done for the children, we give you a little spoiler alert, the dream comes true. This is exactly what happens towards the end of Genesis. Joseph, through all kinds of different circumstances, finds himself in power in Egypt, and his brothers come to get grain, and that's exactly what they do. They they bow down before him and submit themselves to him. And, And we'll get to the story of that in a month or two. But the dream comes true. And we learn over time that it is, it is God who gave this dream to Joseph. But this isn't the last time Joseph is going to dream. He'll, he'll dream other dreams and he'll also interpret other dreams for other people throughout the narrative. What's happening here is a shift in divine revelation, the way that God is speaking to his people. Now what in the world could that possibly have to do with us? You see, The author of Hebrews opens up his letter with a very interesting and and, and mostly familiar passage. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And in these last days, wait a minute, long ago, at many times, and in many ways, divers ways if you're reading the KJV, One of those many ways being direct revelation from the angel of the Lord. One of those other many ways being dreams given to people such as Joseph. And then later on, other means being speaking by the Holy Spirit through the prophets. On and on and on throughout the Old Testament, God's means of revelation to His people is going to shift. And why is it that it's shifting? Why does anything change? But because that it's headed to a particular state... And here is where God's divine revelation culminates in verse 2. In these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Who is the Son? Well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You see, divine revelation culminated in the ultimate revelation of God Himself coming in the person of Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. And look at what we skipped over of what John says in chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through Him, yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. Sound like something we just read? Here Joseph is faithful in his father's house. Here Joseph is given by divine revelation a dream from God himself of something that we know from the text of Scripture is going to come true. And he comes and he offers up the declaration of this truth to his brothers. What's the good in the truth not declared? And what's their response? They hate him. They reject him. Their anger towards him grows. We're going to see next week exactly how that culminates. I'll go ahead and tell you. They're going to try to kill him. Unlike Joseph, they didn't just try to kill our Lord and Savior. They did. They did. And unlike Joseph, whereas later Joseph is going to make the declaration that what you meant for evil, God meant for good, thanks be to God that Jesus wasn't rescued. That the providence of God doesn't direct its way in Jesus missing the cross, but it directs its way every step of the way towards Jerusalem to be crucified on Golgotha. Because as we've already said, 
Jesus Christ is the only truly faithful one. Jesus Christ is the ultimate incarnation of God's divine revelation. You see, divine revelation finds its culmination in the gospel. That left to ourselves, we're not Joseph. We're not even Jacob. We're the wicked, evil, spiteful, jealous, envious 11 other brothers. Mad because daddy loves little brother. But we don't have to be mad. We don't have to be mad because God not only loved his son, but God so loved us that he would send that son to die for us. You see, whereas Jacob treasured and idolized Joseph and and held him dear and pampered him, God loves you and me enough that he would send Jesus Christ to die in our place. And so the call to faithfulness we have from verses 1 through 4 of chapter 37, we can respond to because of the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Because Christ was faithful in all things in His Father's house, we can be faithful in our response and in our obedience to Him. Because divine revelation culminates in Jesus Christ, the Word coming in the flesh, we can now submit ourselves to God in His Word that we have before us in the pages and the text of Holy Scripture. That is exactly what we should do, for that's the only proper response to such a wonderful gospel. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you that we were not left to ourselves to figure this out. That we were not left in our jealousy and in our envy, but that we were rescued from our sin. And we thank you, Father, that as we seek to walk in faithfulness and we face suffering and pain and sickness and persecution in this world, that we will not be left to that suffering forever, but that you have established a day in which you will judge the living and the dead. And we entrust ourselves to those promises, looking to Jesus Christ, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. So, Father, would you be with us as we seek to respond appropriately to such a call and to such a proclamation? We ask it in Jesus Christ.